we'll, we'll combine these two. Uh, Josh Hawley gets on Tucker Carlson. Uh, Tim Scott goes on Ed Henry, both on Fox. They both have the same complaint. And in fact, we heard this. This was the, the huge complaint that we saw yesterday. This is the talking points they must have gotten in the Republican centers. There's nothing new here. It's boring. Nothing uh, burger. No, there's nothing burger. And uh, here it is. But, you know, the, the, va- the, the advantage they have on Fox is that, um, you know, none of, the, none of the people have really been who understand what has been taking place, uh, which, which defeats this talking point. But here it is. They're not even trying to put on evidence. They don't have any evidence, as as has become clear today. This is all about spin. I mean, you're you clerked for Supreme Court justice. You understand this process. I mean, you understand the Constitution. Yeah, there you go. And let's here's Tim Scott. Same thing. There's nothing new. There's nothing new here. There have been nothing but votes to introduce new evidence via subpoenaing documents via subpoenaing witnesses there's been nothing but that that republicans have voted down every single one of them so they're you know this is they're they're this is arbitrage on an asymmetrical information they know that uh they're arguing there's no new information here and they know that the people they're talking to don't realize the reason why there's no new information here is because we have been basically standing in the way of it where are we in, in this whole process well, literally, we are on the fourth Groundhog Day. Tuesday, they presented their case as an opening argument, and they have not added a single fact since Tuesday. So 18 hours yesterday, on 13 hours on Tuesday, several hours on Wednesday, more hours on Thursday, and not a single piece of new information has come forward. As an old guy named Zig Ziglar who passed away, who had an old saying that said that repetition is the mother of learning. Said differently, the mm. Democrats have decided to overwhelm the American people with the same information. So if you hear it often enough, you start believing it's true. The well, good news is the, the president's team will finally have the first public chance to, to present their case to the American people. And I know that that will be a compelling change, sea change for the American people. Lawyer lawsuit? <laughs> Lawyer lawsuit? That's what we're going to. I mean, um, it's interesting. This is the Republican line is we're not hearing anything new. And the Democratic line has been, I think a lot of these people are hearing it for the first time. <laughs> and I think it's probably the case that a lot of these, these uh, senators are hearing it for the first time. It's not going to sway them. I mean, at the end of the day, the political calculation has nothing to do with the reality. It has to do just with how many uh, Trump voters they have to appeal to. But um, again, it's just a question of how shaky the Susan Collins feel, no pun intended. Uh, I'm saying her, her political fortune. Screw you, and, <laughs> and uh, you know, and uh, does uh, Mitt Romney have any type of? Uh, no, I tell. <laughs> no, whatever it was that you were about to say, I did not possess. Um, and, and your family in the garment industry, by exactly. any chance? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Five people. <laughs> but it's going to be interesting over the next couple of days. They're going to wrap this up uh, before the um, uh, State of the Union. I mean, one way or another, they're going to wrap it up. And it's conceivable that there'll be a couple of witnesses, but I, I doubt it. I mean, I, I we've last time I was on the show, we also talked about impeachment. And I was a little bit more, I don't know, optimistic about where it was going to go. I think this, I think the value is still the same. Like this, the value is still the same. Like the more times you repeat this, this narrative, the more people have an opportunity to hear it, the more you have an opportunity for the Republican senators who are not going to vote to impeach to have to be hung by their obvious alignment or lack of, or apathy towards the rule of law, which theoretically appeals to Republicans. Obviously that's not the truth, but you know, there might be a few people who you can suppress. I mean, this is the game, right? You're trying to suppress Republican voters for the same rate. You're trying to suppress democratic voters. Uh, is it being mishandled? I don't think so. I think the Democratic Party has done a pretty good job of not making this a ten poll strategy as part of the elect, uh, part of the general election. It, it comes up every so often, except for a few outliers. Obviously, Adam Schiff has been on this since day one, and he's going to continue to ride this until whatever it, until the wheels fall. He's off. done a good job. Yeah, I, think. I, I mean, I find this stuff uh, the the some of the jargon a little bit overly militaristic, but. Yeah. I mean, you know, he's trying to declare war on Russia, but like that's what, you know, he knows his base better than he knows his base and he knows what's going to, you know, upset and hurt Republicans chances and they're like better than necessarily I do. But I do think that like uh, one of the underlying issues with whether or not that's going to be an effective 
a strategy is, you know, how much faith do Americans just have left in Congress? Like how much faith does America have left in the institutions that are going through the process of talking about impeachment? I think there is a certain amount of, you know, lack of grappling with the fact that a large amount of Americans just don't necessarily like Congress. They don't trust Congress. They find they have all they all have. They all have unhigh unfavorability ratings. So like, I think there is the dual the dual possibility that you know this is not so effective and you know at hurting Trump or it might even strengthen him but on the flip side ideologically speaking I'll just echo what I said last time you know it's it's a good learning opportunity for people to see like what are like could we hold a president who's obviously guilty of many crimes accountable within the system and for at least a few people it's hopefully going to wake up call like oh no it's not possible it's right. like you know eat both you know for structural reasons and also because of the way we've staffed these positions even in a worst case scenario obvious you know obviously benefiting himself obstructing justice concentration camps which is not what, we were, what not this was about but it could be about any number of these things it's about these ties you know can we hold the president accountable for violating the Constitution, for violating the, the sanctity of the office, quote unquote? And the answer is no. The answer is no right now. And that might be the first step towards people going like, oh, we have to do something about that. Presumably, how did we get to this point and how do we get from this point? So there might be value in there, not for the Democratic Party establishment who are in the Republican Party establishment who are complicit in getting us to this point. But for the overall health of the future, it might be worthwhile to go through this process. Yeah, I mean, that's why I look at it. If you know, I think so. I think it's also. I think what you also said there that the the what it's not about is also as just revealing as anything. You know that it's not about you know just sort of rampant corruption. Uh, you know, in terms of things like the hotel rooms and stuff like that. Not to mention concentration camps or war crimes or everything else. I mean, I, I think Scahill just did a good piece on this. That just the, asking a very basic question, which in some ways I. I lose patience for it because it does sometimes feel just like, yeah, that's our lefty complaint, but it has nothing to do with anything. But it's worth asking, like, why is it never on the table to impeach a president for war crimes? Like, it is literally illegal. It's literally, I mean, and he, there is actually a history uh, going back to Reagan of, you know, gadflies in Congress basically saying like, hey, uh, you invaded Grenada. The, that's illegal. Well, the hard or part Dennis is- Or Dennis Kucinich trying to do this with Bush and Cheney. Look how you know? hard it was to get- even support from Democrats well, to impeach point. a hated president on something that was like non-controversial. On well, that's some my level, point. Right? That's my point. Yes. In a way. Like I mean, yeah. it's, this is a blame yeah. the electorate. Uh, I mean, because. Or blame mm, the system. I don't know if I'd blame the electorate for them not going after him on a monuments, which I cannot pronounce. I have no doubt that if more Democrats felt comfortable in that terrain and they impeached him on it, that people would be quite engaged to look at like a, you talk about simple story. Why is it that after he went to Saudi Arabia, 50 rooms were rented yeah, out? The, include yeah, pictures that of would, the hotel. That's not blame the electorate stuff. This is like what we were talking about with Trump talking about like washers and dryers now and always connecting on a level people can understand. You put pictures of these fancy hotel rooms yeah. that people are like, that's that's a way more engaged pu- uh, yeah, public that's than definitely. what's going on. I, I mean, yeah. I agree in terms yeah. of the the uh, emoluments. I guess my point is just like. Um, Maybe the war, war crimes, crimes yeah, are yeah, controversial. Fair, fair we enough. can't even fair get enough. the low hanging. Let's go back to the fruit. monuments. I, fair enough on I mean, war look, crimes. I yep. think it could have a radicalizing effect, just like Brandon is saying. I'm thinking back to protesting the Iraq war along with millions of people and seeing that do absolutely nothing. That radicalized a whole generation of people against the current system that we have. If people see, again, uh, both parties and this old corrupt failing system failing to hold a president accountable for crimes uh they're gonna say the system needs to change yeah and it's not just the republicans fault it's the democrats as well because they don't have a lot of credibility at this point I mean, there are a lot of low hanging fruits, as Michael pointed out, that you wonder why Democrats didn't pursue, especially when you put into conversation with that there does there does seem to be this going back to the looping Bernie's conversation, there does seem to be this willingness to do whatever it takes to keep Bernie from being president. Like even Obama's willing, you know, at least they've hinted to his willingness to speak out, quote unquote, which is doubtful. Uh, 
regarding these, like you know, if Bernie gets too, you know, right. gets too popular, Clinton comes out every few weeks to remind us all why we don't like her, uh, <laughs> you know, and to like, you, you know, be, remind us why she lost. So like you sometimes wonder why like that level of virulence in like, we will do whatever it takes to stop Bernie from winning is not reflected in their treatment of Trump, right? Like there doesn't seem to be that same level of, okay, well, if we got to play dirty, we'll play dirty. They're, they're, and I think that goes back to your earlier point where it's like the race between Clinton and um, Clinton and Trump, like Trump didn't attack her on ideological lines, at least not deep ones, because there is still that tacit agreement between Democrat and Republican Party that they need each other. It's a very weird codependency where the Democratic Party's relationship with the Republican Party is facilitated by the Republican Party becoming more and more radical because they just look better in, contra in contrast. They look better in contrast. And so they find at least in my in my from my observation, they find a bigger threat to the system not to be Trump's various you know emoluments like his very like his his dis his disrespect of the office of president and his crimes committed there as a bigger threat to the quote unquote system as what a Bernie Sanders presidency might be. And so I so I mean I feel like I know why it's because you know well he's not doing anything he's, structural he's, he's doing, just doing structural. stuff that theoretically you yeah. could come in and clean up and mm -hmm. fix and. Uh, because there's no legislation as long as, you know, I think for them, the biggest destruction is, you know, the norms, the crassness, and probably foreign policy on some level, um, because I think these alliances do, don't come back um, if, if, if the other actors are rational about it. Here is one more clip um, from the impeachment this is part of the same sort of uh, agenda that the Republicans have been pushing, which is that, like, this is boring. They don't want people to watch it. I mean, Donald Trump tweeted how many times yesterday? 140 times? Seriously? <laughs> Baby numbers. Jesus. Over that. Over that. <laughs> I hit that before noon. Over that. <laughs> he had a record. With all due respect... <laughs> I'm posting like Chad Vigorous. Today. Theoretically, <laughs> from the best. he's got some must-go-to meetings on any given day. So One would I. hope. Right? <laughs> really? And he's, he tweeted no. how many times? Over 140 times yesterday. It was a new record. The last time, it was at the last hearing. Um, he does not <laughs> want people, the at the very least, he does not want people to pay attention to it. Uh -oh. And uh, so they have all gotten the message. Rick Scott... The last time he was put upon this, uh, this like uh, for this extended period of time, he was issuing um, uh, dozens of uh, pleadings of the Fifth Amendment because his company had been involved in the biggest Medicare, or Medicaid, Medicaid fraud in uh, the history of the country, and so he's a little exasperated. I think. It's fine what we went through last night. It was a lot of process. It got really boring. I don't know if you stayed up to watch it. It got, I think it was like... Did you stay awake? <laughs> yeah, I say you, have to, okay. you have to stay awake. You have to sit in your chair. Well, everybody did. You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't drink anything but water. Let me ask you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You're a fucking senator. I'm sorry, my language. But like, honestly, like, and like Americans sit through jury duty and you are whining about sure, being sure. a senator. You're Gimlet. Here you are. Oh, thank you. And I think I had an order of some mozzarella sticks with that. Uh, I, would, I would love that right now. All you're getting. Is, <laughs> yeah, sounds good. All you're getting is water. In the galley. Um, no, that's the most bratty thing I've ever heard in my life. Uh, you know, one would think. You don't care about working people. You should be ashamed to show your face around. That's why he's not getting any more coffees because yeah, right. he does. He's not, he's not yeah, allowed like to go to the coffee shop. Sounds like Starbucks. that's the real reason he can yep. only drink water. Exactly. <laughs> he looks a bit like Stephen Molyneux, like a little bit like oh. Stefan Molyneux. Yeah. I'm sorry, I, I don't. Stefan. Yeah, I, 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 right. I refuse to legitimize Canadians. <laughs> uh, here is that's a dangerous thing to say with this audience. Speaking of, of which, Canadians. Rudy Giuliani 